Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Urban Language Teaching and Research at Georgia State University, I welcome you to the eighth annual World Languages Week. As the center is known, it's known as CULTR, and it's one of 16 federally funded Title VI language resource centers in the United States. The center has created a unique identity around service, servicing the needs of all students and the communities they represent by helping to promote language learning opportunities as part of 21st century global education. Guided by its core values of access, advocacy, outreach, and research, the center has gained a national reputation for innovative approaches to promoting access to language education for all students, regardless of their socioeconomic and ethnic background. My name is Edvige Jean-Francois. I am the executive director of the Center for Studies on Africa and its diaspora at Georgia State University. Our center focuses on promoting understanding of people of African descent and people from the diaspora. We have uh, a strong pillar that we follow. And as the inaugural, inaugural executive director, it is thrilling for me to be here as part of this panel, as someone who believes in language and learning and its importance. Before introducing the panelists, uh, I'd like to address a couple of housekeeping and technical questions first. Uh, as part of this media and entertainment panel, uh, which I'm moderating today, and I'm super excited about that. I'd like to remind everyone that all panels this week are being recorded and will be available after the event. All attendees will remain muted throughout the entire session. Our panel discussion will be approximately 35 to 40 minutes, will be followed by Q&A, and I encourage everyone to put their questions in the Q&A. Uh, you may submit, them, submit your questions throughout this discussion. And after in the Q&A box by clicking on the Q&A and it's where you can put your questions, look at the icon at the bottom. If you like questions that you see, click the thumbs up icon to promote this question at the top of the list. The questions you see, again, you're going to click and, 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 and uh, promote it and, and give it a thumbs up. And uh, the team here uh, will enter resource links for you throughout the conversation in the chat. So thank you so much for using the Q&A for your questions. And now I would like to introduce uh, my esteemed panelists, uh, Judith martinez Saudry digital content strategist for the state of Georgia, and uh, Megan Jeffrey, who's director of strategic initiatives and communication at the National Foreign Language Center at the University of Maryland. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, Judith, I, I wanna start with you. Uh, please start by introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about what you do, and then Really, I wanna, I wanna throw my first question as part of that, once you do that is, what does language mean to you? So please first introduce yourself and, and tell us what language means to you. Judith, I think you're muted, I cannot hear you. Okay, sorry about that. A little bit of nervousness, believe it or not. <laughs> No need at all. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It is an honor to be in this panel and, and to share experience with you and all the students. Um, I'm originally from Mexico, Monterey, Mexico. I moved to Georgia about 25 years ago. I came basically to learn English and life change and Georgia has become uh, my home now. I'm a 20 uh, year I've been, I'm a media veteran. I've been working in media, my multicultural media primarily for the last 20 years. I was a uh, publisher for a decade. I publi published the first bilingual newspaper in the state of Georgia. From there, I went to work for television to start a new, a new newscast with Telemundo Atlanta, where I became a four-time Emmy uh, 
award winner. And after that, I went to work for digital media. And currently, I work for the state of Georgia and in the state of Georgia government and communications. So my career over 20 years is in focus on communicating to the Hispanic audience in the states and in the out, outside of the states, making sure that important and current information gets in the hands of the Hispanic audience. Uh, well, it, it's, uh, you know, it warms my heart as someone who also comes from media and, and to be talking to you about this, because as you know, it's something we, we, we take uh, uh, very seriously and the importance of, of that engagement. Megan, I wanna go to you and then I'll come back to uh, Judith to answer my first question. Tell us uh, what I like is you've described yourself as someone who's had this rich cultural background of intersections of race and, 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 and culture. So, so tell us about your work and also uh, your connection to language and culture. Yeah, thanks also for having me. Um, this is such a pleasure to chat with you and all of the students and just anybody who's listening here. Um, my background is very disorganized <laughs> because nothing was intentional. And I, um, and I say that because the way I've gotten to where I am, which is Director of Strategic Initiatives and Communication, and also comedian is by following what feels good to me and what comes naturally to me. And language comes natural to me. I've always used language to connect with other people. It was my way of saying hi to a new friend. It's really, really simple and very, very basic. And so for me, um, my background is all sorts of culturally diverse and mixed up and doesn't make any sense to anybody on the outside. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about just some of the different elements that kind of make me who I am today. I am white, as you can see, European American ancestry, and uh, I grew up in a all black neighborhood. And um, and then I was also a Baha'i growing up. I'm, I'm still a Baha'i, but uh, that means that I grew up around tons of diversity. Specifically, there was a lot of Iranians that I was growing up around. So I was hearing Farsi all of the time. And I went to school, I was homeschooled my, um, almost my whole childhood, except uh, uh, when I was 14, it was time for me to go to school. And uh, my first influence was from a Trinidadian teacher. And so um, then I started studying Mandarin in high school. And then I, I, I lived in China and then I married a Trinidadian and had um, children with said Trinidadian. And so I just have so much mixture that I started studying Spanish and Russian and Tagalog and Lingala and just anything that would give me a new friend from another part of the world, I was all over it. And I fell into comedy. This was not intentional, but through my comedy is how I connect with more people and I use my language skills to do so. Well, uh, I think I think again to mention what excites me about this is this mixture, right? I mean, uh, uh, among us, you've got Haitian Creole. I'm Haitian American. You've got Farsi. You've got Spanish. You've got Russian. You've got, as you mentioned, Tagalog, Lengala. So it, it's sort of like the reflection of of the stew, is what I call it. And and Judith, I want to go back to you. With that said, what does language mean to you? What do you, what do you think you want to communicate to the students who, who and anyone listening uh, about the meaning of that? Well, to me, language is life, totally life. Uh, like I shared initially, I moved to Georgia to learn English. I thought I knew, but <laughs> turns out I didn't. So I wanted to be able to communicate with other people with, that had different languages and different backgrounds. And sure enough, I fell in love with my husband, which this is a total coincidence. Megan, my husband is Persian, he's from Iran. So I immersed myself into the American culture, but also into the Persian culture, learning Farsi, learning the cultural um, differences, but also the cultural coincidences or what we have in common. There's so many things we have in common that people wouldn't really understand of there until you live in that culture. So to me, languages is, is an option to open yourself to the world. It's opportunities, it's new horizons, it's traveling, it's food, it's music, it's just a way of living. And it's so 
exciting to be able to be switching back from one language to another, being able to drive and put one song in Spanish and then go to Farsi and then go to English and then go to another language. Once you learn more than one language, you get so sensitive and so curious to learn more about why is people dressing like that? Why, why does that song have a little bit of Arabic rhythm into that? And when you, when you start learning and going to the history, all the languages and cultures are intertwined. So uh, understanding where we come from and uh, also learning, making new friends, like Megan said, is one of the most, um, I said, it, it was the first thing I, I did when I came to Georgia, learning language, making new connections, making longtime friends. And that's how I met my soulmate who uh, at that time didn't speak Spanish. Well, well, there's a saying that the, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Some of you may be familiar with that. I, I tend to think of language as the window to the world, as you mentioned. So Judith, describe the places you've traveled, because I feel like everywhere you go, and, I, and I've been I've had the opportunity both in my work and, and my personal life to, to travel uh, all over the world. And every place I go, I pick up something. So uh, tell us about that journey for you as you traveled, as you had different experiences that led to your language experience. Uh, what did you pick up in terms of language, but as well in terms of the experiences and, and culture that informs your work today? Well, um, I want to become a little bit romantic. When I first met my husband 25 years ago, he told me he was Persian. And I said, hmm, Persian, nobody speaks that language anymore. That's what I heard or like what I learned when I was in school. And he said, yes, we do. And, and in Iran, that's what we speak. And I said, I love to go to Persepolis. When I was a little kid, I, I remember reading history and just thinking of trying to imagine how Persepolis looked like, which is, you know, the cradle of civilization. He said, when we get married, I'll take you. He told me that the very first time we met. And sure enough, after we got married, he took me. So I went to Persepolis. I could walk in all those ruins. I could really see what history has been saving there for us and understanding how Arabs came to Iran and conquer Iran and try to impose um, the uh, Muslim religion. And they did, they, they, they were successful. And then they tried to impose Arabic in, in um, uh, Persians, but they couldn't. Persians kept their, their original language, which is Farsi. And then Spaniards came to Latin America with the same model. They came to impose Spanish, they came to impose Catholicism, um, and, but they were, they were successful. You know, most Latinos, we speak Spanish, we are Catholics. So when you see the history and this history repeats itself, it, it was really eye-opening for me. And also I, I could feel that no matter where I go, in that case, it was in Iran is where I travel most of the time and Turkey, no matter where I go, people want to make a connection with you. Maybe I look a little bit Eastern, I don't know, but I've had all kinds of experiences with people reach out to me, they offer me tea, they offer me sweets, they smile, like almost like language is not a barrier. You know, when you are traveling, especially you, you have to be curious and you have to be open to whatever comes to you. So um, going back to Persepolis, my first trip in there, I wanted to, to, to get on a camel. And my husband said, there's no camels in Persepolis. It's too hot. There's no camel. Sure enough, there was a camel. My wish came true. So I, I, I had the opportunity to ride on a camel. And, and it took me all around Persepolis. I felt I was one of those queens that used to come to all those feasts that they threw, you know, back in the days when Persepolis was, you know, the, the main city of the world. But um, to summarize it, make connections. When you speak another language or when you're interested, not only about the language, but other culture, people feel that you are interested. And then you start developing other senses. Like at the beginning, you don't understand, but then you start observing a little more, listening, tasting the food and just following the rhythm, the way they walk, the way they do things and respect also the way they do things. That's very important, especially if you travel to the Middle East. But um, I can go on and on with stories. I don't want to take more and I'm sure Megan has something to share. Megan, please, uh, how, 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 what has that been like for you, your own journey traveling and having these experiences and how has it enriched you professionally today? Well, I grew up, um, in um, a very uh, 
I well, just it, we, we we didn't have the dough if you want to you know say the reality. Um, and so it wasn't. I, I didn't get vacations, and I didn't not even family vacations. We didn't have that. And so I think it's really important when I talk about this to preface. Um, what I'm saying with there are other ways to get an international experience if you can't go abroad. But for me, I got a scholarship when I was in um, high school. I was 16 and I went and I studied overseas in China. And it was my first time going overseas, but it was my first time on an airplane. And that that first time I was going halfway across the world, you know what I mean? So I get on the flight and I go to China and that was my first time overseas. And then I went um, later on throughout life. I've been to Israel. I've been to um, Trinidad a bunch of times. I've been to Singapore and the Philippines and South Africa. I've been to a number of different places. But what I always tell people, because it's very, um, it's very nice to think that you know we can all study abroad but that's not the case we can't all study abroad and, and to learn a language the best thing obviously is immersion in the country but if you can't do that there are certainly ways to do that here within the united states and you simply just find the community of the target language and you make friends like it's really really simple this is nothing um crazy and then also i, I do want to plug in here there are some really great free resources from the National Foreign Language Center that I'd love to share. One being Lectia, L-E-C-T-I-A. It's a free app for anyone studying 19 languages, which I won't belt off right now, but many of them are taught um, around universities. But please do check that out to um, supplement your language journeys or your language teaching if that's what um, you're doing. Um, so that's that's what I would ask. Well, I, I, I'm all about the, the, the different language apps. I, I worked in, in Hong Kong for three months and I made good use of the apps where literally you could get simultaneous tra translation to everything was understood and and you know you could you could navigate and, and travel. It's, it's changed so much. I, I you know I have one reflection based on what you you're both talking about in terms of language. Part of it is you grow up, you don't even think about language right what we call your mother tongue it's whether it's english spanish you grow up speaking language so it's sort of like the at first pass you don't think about language but then you do need to think about language the importance of having it in the professional world personally uh ease of doing business uh across the world really and and i know for me when i first came to the us at seven not speaking English and, and having the courage to get up and, and, and to speak in public. And I've described it as the words feeling like molasses and, and having that sense of uh, almost shame, right? And, and I hope that this conversation, what it does, it, it inspires that you can push through, right? You know, I'm, I'm from Haiti and, and Judith is, is from Mexico and, and obviously we've been able to, to master a language. So I, I want you, Judith, to talk about that sense that for, for some people, maybe people listening now, there's that sense of alienation, right? Perhaps not speaking a language or not speaking it perfectly. So what kind of encouragement can you give to sort of pursue and believe you're gonna get uh, beyond that and, and not to get discouraged in your language learning journey? Correct. For all the bilinguals, trilinguals who are listening to us uh, right now, I just want to applaud you because it takes a lot of courage and a lot of time and dedication to understand another language and another, another culture. So just when you understand that you are already ahead of the game, there's no reason to feel down, to feel you don't belong, that you feel, that you feel uncomfortable. Like when I was um, studying English um, at Georgia Tech, I was offered a class to uh, lower my accent and basically erase my accent and I got a little bit offended back then and I'm like do I really need it because my accent determines who I am and um, I don't want to pretend to sound like someone who I'm not I understand their phonetics and there's certain ways to speak but to me my accent is part of my personality so um, I've been told in Georgia many times welcome to Georgia even though I lived here for 25 years I've been asked if I, if I need a ride to the airport, for example, <laughs> once I went to a, a public university to give a speech. But those things don't bother me anymore. I, I just feel proud that I can communicate and also help others. Um, one of the things that I enjoy the most is going to 
to the mall or to the movies and I, when I see that elderly uh, Hispanic um, residents are wondering how to ask for a Coke or how to ask for something and I can serve a translator, that, that gives me a lot of joy. So in those days when I think like, oh, I have an accent, oh, I don't write as perfect. It's normal to feel like that, don't get me wrong. I just remember like, you know what? I bring more and more to much more to this world by helping others, by understanding two cultures, by leaving a legacy also. Um, for example, the newspaper that I used to co-edit and co-own, um, now is gonna be part of a little museum at a local university. So I'm leaving a legacy and I there's no, no reason for me to be ashamed of my accent or my, you know, not perfect grammar, uh, there's Grammarly and so many other apps that can help us, you know, perfect that. But no, no app will help you feel proud if you don't feel really, really proud. Um, just look around and think like, look, I can communicate, I can understand, and I can go back and forth. When you have that mental ability, then you are kind of a unique world because there's no many people like you. So feel proud if you're bilingual, trilingual, you're doing a great job. Uh, Megan, what I like in, 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 in your bio, uh, it says something, some, something to the effect of, you know, uniting people through language and culture. And, and what is the unity? How do you get there, right? Because we, we can be uh, in, in, in spaces that, that don't seem as, as tolerant, obviously not, not our audience here. But how do you how do you push back back against that and show the beauty and and how it strengthened you personally and professionally? Can you share any personal anecdotes, for example, where uh, speaking a different language has enabled you to, to to make a connection? Oh, man, my whole life is making connections and I do it anywhere and all the time and without even thinking of it. But my advice is really going back to practicalities. It's like. And I didn't learn this until I was much older, but I used to, when learning a language myself, I used to say, well, I can't do it because I don't have the background or I don't have the proper training. And I don't have the resources. I don't have this. Da, 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 da. Until it occurred to me that we were all put here on this earth with the same potentialities as in we all have hands, right? We all can move our, I mean, I, I'm talking about an able-bodied person here, I understand, but we all have brains, we all have the ability to, um, to do things. And so why did, I, uh, why did I tell myself that somebody else was better than me just because they could speak something, maybe, whatever. So um, once I kind of got the idea of um, living really what the oneness of humanity to me meant, um, it colors everything. So as a Baha'i, I grew up with the ideals of the oneness of humanity, where everyone is equal, no matter their background. And um, if we look at the human garden, we are exactly that. We are a bunch of beautiful, different kind of varieties that come together. And if you have a garden that's all roses, that's nice and all. It smells pretty. But what if we introduce other kinds of uh, flowers in there that have different fragrances? And suddenly this, this beautiful rose garden turns into a beautiful human garden with all these varieties and smells and it's it's very much more enjoyable so when you when you talk about things like um going in homogenous groups and 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 trying to get them to understand that there are other varieties that also are beautiful sometimes that can be challenging particularly given um the the past ideals that we that some of our counterparts believe in right so if there are people who don't believe in the oneness of humanity that can be a little difficult but when you introduce little tiny concepts that just make sense it's kind of hard to fight against those like scientifically it's proven that um, we are one that not not one person is greater than the next just because of a skin tone like we have that proven um, and so that's to me is really what drives connecting people is through practicality and with that with i also think a, a sort of like a an added benefit to speaking of language is the desire to travel right because once you speak a language you want to go and see the world and connect to people who speak the the same language and in turn i mean i've i've made so many terrific connections traveling whether on the train or at, at airports and there's that sense of, of a shared community and shared space uh judith obviously you're you're a communicator you're in the field of communications 
and and in the media entertainment space. And, and we have students who, who may want to see how does the language fit in with, within, within that profession. What uh, advice would you give in terms of, of those who, who want to pursue a career in media communications? Well, I would say that um, just find your niche, whether you're going to do news or you know, more art or more music, whatever it is your niche find out who the audience is. Um, I have primarily background in news and information. So the Hispanic um, consumer or the Hispanic audience is the second one in terms of language speaking in the state of Georgia. So if you want to uh, pursue a career in news, make sure you learn some Spanish, make some connections with um, Hispanic organizations such as the consulates. There are consulates from all countries in Latin America, in Atlanta, that will make you, uh, help you get sources. Um, but just to give you a, a quick example, when I work at Telemundo, they used to have a partnership with WSB uh, Channel 2 because they wanted us to help them uh, report on the news when there was a Hispanic person involved in an accident or involved in the news. And um, those Hispanic sources would not speak with anyone but someone who spoke their language and they felt comfortable with. So we help each other to um, uh, report the news correctly and have the information from the source. So be, be um, uh, sensitive of the, your audience. Please know your audience first and then um, pick the language that you will want to learn. If you go to Miami, Spanish, number one. If you go to New York, Spanish would be it. If you go to Texas, if you go to California, all the big markets, Spanish is the, the, the second most spoken language after English. So um, start making uh, taking classes and um, don't be afraid of speak it. Just practice, practice, practice. Make good friends and will fr friends will, will help you, will correct you. Um, but also start learning about the culture. You know, Latinos are not all about piñatas and tacos and burritos. We have so much more to offer. So start to uh, learning what, where do we come from? Why are we here to begin with? When did Latinos come to Georgia? Why, for example, start in, in your own community and then learn about um, the immigration dynamic in the whole country and in the whole world for, for that sake. And, and I want to add to that as well, because you make a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm from uh, the media space, at least formally, before I came to, to GSU. And, and I can give you one example of how my language skills sort of helped me be, uh, cover what was a major story in 2010 when the Haiti earthquake happened. I basically went to my boss and said, listen, I'm Haitian American. I speak Creole, and immediately I began part of the uh, part of that news coverage. And I ended up being one of two uh, CNN journalists who spent several weeks there, being part of of that uh, news coverage. It was a was a difficult uh, uh, story to cover, but I remember an instance where we were uh, covering part of the story and there were some people who were desperate for information as you can imagine infrastructure uh power grids everything was devastated and one of them began to shout speak creole speak creole because they were watching our reporting we we're broadcasting obviously to the world in english and they were desperate for information and i was able to 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 sort of be a guide beyond my work as a journalist so it is a tool that you'll never know whatever work you do will come up and you can help people and 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 also to to go back to something about media and entertainment itself it, it is a skill that you can take to another uh, profession. One, once you have that, I think language can only can only benefit that uh, as well. Megan, uh, what tangible steps uh, can students take while still in school to put themselves in a in a better position to to find that first job in general, and also specifically if they speak another language, how do they put that best foot forward? Um, I think there are two things that I would recommend. The first being, okay, three, um, but it's combined in all three. Uh, learn, just learn as much as you can. 
and explore all of the fields. And then even if you explore one, you, you narrow down, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, six months later, as you're doing it, you're like, oh, this sucks. I don't like it at all. Then don't say, oh man, I already chose it. So therefore I have to do this. Boom, 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 which is what so many of us do, um, even as adults allow yourself the flexibility to change and to go into the next step, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing in, in learning is to do informational interviews. Find people that you respect, who carry positions and titles that you idealize and ask them for an informational interview. What you wanna do is you cold call, cold email, whatever. You don't know them. It doesn't matter. Don't be afraid just because they have a big lofty title that maybe they won't read your message. If they don't, that's their loss. You find the next person. You just get a lot of information that way and that opens up a lot of doors. And the third thing I'm going to say is a book that I recommend to every single person out there, no matter your age, is to read a book called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. And this book, um, I was afraid of the title for a very long time because I thought, oh, how pompous. I don't want to think of myself as better than someone else. Um, but when I actually read it, I realized not only did it change the way I thought about myself, but it changed the way I thought about other people. I mean, I would see people on the street and be like, do they know how much of a badass they are? Oh my God. You know, cause we're not tapping into our unique contributions to the world. And that book really, really changed my life. I read it about once a year because it gives me um, more energy to be who I am. And I, I, I got to throw in the fourth thing, <laughs> be who you are, be who you are and continue to um, discover who you are as you go, cause you will evolve and be patient with yourself. But if you're not yourself, then you um, are doing a disservice to the whole of humanity because if you don't like people. yourself, who who else will, right? You're the first, you, you shape your, your, your inner compass yeah. and, and yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say this, the tail end of that is, you know, you have a duty in this world to be you and that should both bring you comfort, um, but also give you more motivation to know that you're doing the right thing, even if it doesn't you know, you're not sure. Do and things will come. That's it. Uh, that, that's perfectly set, said. And I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't started already, to please start putting your questions in the q and looking forward to, to, to making sure we address as many a, a, as we can. Uh, Judith, I think you've shared some, some good kernels with us already uh, that you, you've learned. I think if we can sort of uh, synthesize, right? Uh, Megan had her, her, her four points. If you could synthesize uh, the lessons learned, the, the best practices, whether it's outward or, or the inner self as, as Megan spoke of, how would you, how would you put it for, for you in terms of giving that encouragement? I want to tell the students that wherever they are, wherever they are right now, is preparing for something better and for, for a next step. Just to give you a quick, real example, when I was 20 years old, I ended up doing my first internship at a TV station. It's not what I wanted to do, but it's what life gave me. Who would have known that 20 years later, I would have used that experience when I started working at television. So everything that happens in your life has a connection to something else. Imagine your life as, a, as this bridge or a Lego piece that you're connecting. So one thing is gonna take you to another. Um, accept what life is giving you. There's always a lesson to learn. I know it sounds like your mom, but believe me, it's true. And one thing I would add to Megan's advice is start your own media, create a podcast, for example. I do have a podcast I started for fun and it became a business. When you are interviewing people older than you and you, you just learn so much, you make connections, you understand how the real life works, and it doesn't take any investment from you to start a podcast, just, just for example. And at the end of your career, when you start looking for opportunity, you, can, you already have a demo with 40, 50, 100 interviews that you can show um, to your potential employee or partner, start your own business. Right now, many students are entrepreneurs. They have the entrepreneur spirit. Employers, they're looking for people who come up with ideas, who are willing to take a risk, who are not just eight to five, this is my job description, and here I am. 
No, we want people who are creative, who think out of the box and who really bring the uniqueness into the world. So don't be afraid to be unique. Spend more time in finding who you really are. Make sure your self-esteem is strong and is ready to go out to the world because when you're there, you're going to be successful no matter what. If you know who you are and you don't let the little things, you know, uh, bug you. Um, just to close, language, like I said at the beginning, has been a blessing for me. I love it. I've had all kinds of uh, wonderful experiences. One of them was to win my first Emmy as a news anchor in Spanish in the state of Georgia, unheard of. You can find the video in my Instagram, and I'm sure they will share it in the comments. But I did forget English. When I went on the stage, I totally went blank, and it was okay. And I had so much fun and English came back to me after a few seconds. So don't be afraid. You know, life is going to throw you wonderful gifts and it's going to throw you wonderful opportunities if you're ready for it. So even if you're not 100% in the language that you want to speak, just keep working on it and, and you'll get there. But don't, don't lose track of where you want to get and prepare. Prepare every day. If you learn five new words every day, in that language that you like to learn, see how many words will you learn in a year? Absolutely, right? And 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 I, I definitely, before you close, I wanna, for me, my parents have been such an inspiration to me, right? And, and everybody has that person who has contributed to their superpower. And, and again, it's my parents came to this country as immigrants. I came here at seven and have, sort of had a wealth of amazing experiences, but it, it was always, they, they pushed education, they pushed that sense of self-determination, right? They, they pushed that curiosity about the world. And when I went to them and said, you know, I wanna study abroad, I was 20 years old and you know, I went off to Spain and was an exchange student. It was something that sort of took them aback. They were afraid, right? To send their baby off into the world. But they opened up. They let me have that opportunity to go out and see the world. And I'm thankful for them in, in so many ways. And again, it was that sort of initial sense of adventure that led to my role today at a center uh, focused on uplifting people from Africa and of African descent, which is the work of CSAD. So what, what or who uh, became, was, or is still your, your superpower before you became the superwoman that you are today? <laughs> Thank you. Well, in my case, it's same as you, it was my parents. Um, when, uh, actually, my aunt, she, she passed two years ago. She, she was my only relative in Georgia. She told me, uh, Judith, when you finish college in Mexico, why don't you come here for six months and uh, my leave right around Georgia Tech, that's where I went. So why don't you come study? And um, at that time, my parents hesitated a little bit, but they saw me so excited. So they're like, go. Uh, my grandma, she already passed. She told my dad, her wings are too wide. They won't fit in this little cage. He said that. She said that. I'll never forget those words. Uh, so their encouragement, their support. And so many other people that crossed my path in Georgia, so many friends that were so patient with me, you know, when I wanted to speak and I wanted to speak fast and they told me, just take it easy. People would understand you. Nobody's going to make fun of you. And I want to say that everyone in Georgia that I've ever crossed my, my path has been so patient and so lovely. And I love that. Absolutely. It's the people who are, you know, who, who just put the wind at our back and not to our faces who help us navigate the world. And, uh, and I always want to pay homage. And I'm sure, Megan, there are people were have been in your life, whether it's a school teacher, who, who've influenced and inspired you. So take that moment as we wrap up to, to share that with the students, because they may have people right now that uh, that are encouraging them. So it would be great to hear that they can push you forward. For me, there's not a specific individual. For me, it was the people, the immigrants who came to this country, like specifically the mothers who work 
so many jobs and who have kids and um, and they're doing the menial jobs that we look down upon as a society. And I just thought, what's my excuse? You know what I mean? Like, what is my excuse? And I do come from a, a, a lower socioeconomic uh, background and, and, you know, the struggle, if you will. But I did, I wanted to use the inspiration that I saw from the, the people who came here, who made something of themselves so that um, I could then not necessarily make them proud, but I could, I could use the, they were my inspiration just to, you know, put it simply, they were my inspiration. And um, I, I, I also, Jen Sincero also writes this other book um, about money. And there's this idea among um, lower socioeconomic classes that, you know, we can't have a lot of money. We can't do this because it's out of reach. It's only for the elite. It's only for these people, whatever, whatever. And until you sort of realize that it's okay, that money is not an evil thing. And that when you do get the money, you can do things with this money that's gonna change the lives of other people. Uh, so that's sort of my inspiration is just how far reaching can I get? And within my role, whether that's a National Foreign Language Center and you know, kind of pulling people together through language or it's through comedy, reaching different audiences around the globe, that's my aim is to pull everybody up to not in, in traditional comedy we we like to make fun of people and oh look at this how stupid this person is and and look how they're you know we, we it's derogatory most of the time and my avenue within comedy is to appraise the standard of the oneness of humanity I, I love it. That sense of gratitude. Uh, thank you both for opening up and, and sharing, uh, because I think I, I think part of this community, I feel that we are for, for, for this hour. Uh, uh, so thank you for that. And uh, I do want to give our students and our audience a chance to ask of you whatever they may. And I think the questions uh, have come up. And this one, I, I kind of I want to pose to to both of you. The question is, uh, I'll start with you, Megan. How do I learn to network, right? I feel after COVID, I don't quite know how to approach this. I know about LinkedIn, but how can I meet people and make connections face-to-face, -face, which is which is part of what was lost in COVID, right? That very tactile, I'm, I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, I'm feeling you, I'm feeling you. So how do people reintegrate and start networking again, Megan? Well, I like to talk about this because I'm an extrovert and I am not afraid of anybody. I don't care what kind of, you, you can be the president and I'm still going to say what's up to you. Like, I don't care about that. And part of that is what you have to lose. You have to lose this feeling of inferiority just because someone has a title. Um, so that's part of it. It's just like this internal work that we have to do. But the second part does have to do with LinkedIn and email and things that we're so tired of using, but it is the only way for many people that they'll get in touch with you. And you wanna make it as easy as possible. So when you're writing these intro messages or emails, you are saying, can I have 15 minutes of your time and stick to the 15 minutes. Don't, unless they allow you stick to that 15 minutes and you wanna say exactly what you wanna get out of it. And you wanna say not, I really want a job. Can you give me a job? Nobody's going to talk to you about that. You want to say, I'm really interested in how you got to where you are. It's really great. And, and I aspire to do the same. Do you have 15 minutes to talk? I can, you know, treat you to coffee or um, if, you know, within your, if they're within your locality or um, I, maybe you're Zoom fatigued um, of would a phone call be okay? Or maybe perhaps messaging. Do something that you think is the easiest thing that they can't say no to. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Right. And who who says no to coffee? Well, maybe tea, but I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> and who, honestly, who says no to talking about themselves? I think that's what we're missing is we feel like, oh, they're not going to talk to me. Who am I? But then when you think about it, the person on the receiving end is getting some sort of praise from you saying that, oh, you're so cool. I want to talk to you. And then they're like, hey, I am pretty cool. All right. I'll talk to you. <laughs> You know, it's really like human like you're, it's just, this is all very simple. We don't need to overcomplicate any of this stuff. There's no secret sauce. There's no magical tool. It's really basic. So Judith, uh, what about you? How does one network? How do we reintegrate uh, back? What is the post COVID world? So if I wanted to make a connection, what would you recommend? 
Well, I'm just like Megan. I'm extremely extrovert and I knock on doors. They don't open me. I open windows, you know, I find a way to get to get to people. Cry in there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but what I would recommend to students is to uh, go out to the world, go out and volunteer. Let's say you want to meet a politician or someone who's coming to the Catter Center and he's going to be speaking. Go to that event, go to that function, try to find the one to volunteer, find the, the time to volunteer in that organization that you believe in and that you like the leadership. Also, remember, even if you're asking for 15 minutes, you're giving, you have value for that person. One of the things that we look, I'm almost 50 years old, I don't mind telling my age, I want to know how are the 20 year old uh, students thinking? What are the consumer habits? What are they thinking about the world? I like to have that conversation with younger people because it's, it's, it's different points of view. So offer that point of view to a high top executive, um, if it's a person you want to reach and, and go back to the old days of networking, volunteering, offering something valuable, create your little networking event, do a meetup with students and teachers or with corporate and students, get creative. No, no one, don't wait for things to get done for you. Get out of the box, think out of the box and get creative connecting to those people. Isn't when when you have those face to face create, uh, connections and human connections, magic happens, and you meet people that will never forget you. And you will. I have met I have met people 15, 20 years ago that is, they they still reach out to me to offer me a job, which okay. is which is what I wanted 20 years ago. They didn't have it. They have it now. But you know what? I kept the connections. We kept. Uh, I kept. Uh, I have an old. Uh, agenda you know I like writing I'm old style and I remember people's birthdays and I send cards and I just keep in touch and I culti cultivate the relationship it's not just to get one interview then it's to continue with that th that relationship remember when it's a birthday the work anniversary and just continue to interact LinkedIn is beautiful I love LinkedIn it's I've had all my uh, professional um, opportunities have been through LinkedIn but I'm not just liking, I'm commenting, I'm sharing positive content, I'm sharing content that can be good for others. So always try, we, when we are young, we're hoping to people that people will give things to us. We need to start giving first, give your time, give your attention, give your energy, and then you'll get back for sure. Love, love, love. And before I get to my last questions for both of you, uh, perfect segue into sharing content. Uh, CSAD does have an event coming up that I want to share the flyer. Uh, it's called, uh, it's part of an initiative through uh, a, a grant from the Mellon Foundation. And it's called, it's on internet intersectionality in the American South. So we will be having a conversation with Dr. Joan Morgan. Uh, it's going to be a lively conversation uh, in conjunction with Dr. Regina uh, Regina Bradley, moderated by our own here at GSU, uh, Dr. Lakita Bonnet Bailey, and uh, and it's uh, it should be an engaging uh, conversation sponsored by the Mellon Foundation, the College of Law, and 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 CSAD, and that's going to be next Tuesday. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll see the flyer soon in in the chat uh, before we close this event. We have another question, which I think it's it's a question for both of you. And in a way, we probably could have started with that question, but I think in a way it's good to kind of end with it because uh, it's about a typical day to talk about your role. What is a normal day? Is, is, is there such a thing as normal? So it's a three-parter. And if you can be as succinct as you can, so it's a little bit more about your current role. Uh, what is a normal day or... Uh, inside the life of, and, and also do you use language, languages in, in this role? So I'll start with you, Megan, and then I'll, 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 I'll ask the same of you, Judith. A normal day, there is no normal, typical routine day, as you probably um, have guessed. It's all about what my tasks are necessarily. So for me in my role as strategic initiatives director in communication, I oversee both things. So I'm overseeing marketing, social media, um, 
any sort of public relations aspects, these kinds of things where I, I, I serve on panels, those things. Um, and then the other part is the strategic initiatives and thinking ahead about where do we want to go? Where do we want to take our products? Who do we want to reach? And then I go about reaching those populations. And so it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of uh, research. It's a lot of talking to people. It's a fun role. Do I use my Chinese? No, because I don't need to, but um, like I'm not sitting there translating anything, but um, I sort of do in some senses. So I might talk to a group of students studying Chinese from within my current role to talk about Lectia or the portal or um, teacher support uh, resources that we have all free. I mean, the I, I'm really lucky that I get to share amazing quality resources with the entire world and not have to get anything from it. And then the other piece is we are grant funded. So it's looking for grants. It's looking for new opportunities and ways to partner with other organizations out there. Terrific. Uh, Judith, a typical day, if there's such a thing, uh, for you and 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 uh, how do you use language with, with, within that day? Yes, there's there's not a typical day, and I love it. You know, because one day you can be writing or planning or executing or meeting. Um, I'm, I work with a team of strategies. We advise government agencies on their communications, the web the web uh, formats, their chatbots. And right now, currently, I am using language because I oversee the uh, production of the um, Spanish version of the elections page for the state of Georgia, where you can go online and find everything in Spanish there, where to vote, what time to vote, et cetera. That, that's my, my, my um, language use of, of that in that project. But aside from work, I'm extremely active in my community. I do a podcast. I produce a podcast. I also do workshops for women to promote self-esteem and career development. I love to volunteer in my community. So I'm extremely active. So I would say about half of my day is in English and the other half is in Spanish. And there's some Farsi here and there. But um, uh, one of my passions is always to connect people and to help people get a better life and feel better about it, about themselves. And um, so that's when my Spanish comes handy. Well, thank you, muchas gracias. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I should say, you know, uh, merci en pile que nous te la rencontré ensemble. It's Creole for thank you very much that we all uh, gathered here today and uh, Many, many thanks to, uh, for this invitation to uh, uh, the family, uh, to be part of the GSU family, to be part of, of uh, World Languages Week. Uh, this, this concludes uh, today's nonprofit and community, I, I should say this concludes today's media and entertainment panel. Uh, and thank you, Megan, thank you, uh, Judith. For, for being part of it and, and sharing in this love of language and learning. And we didn't get to talk about how fun it is to travel and see the world. This is not hard work. I'm telling you, 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 you get one language and you use it across so many, you know, I speak Spanish and I use it in Portugal. I've used it in Italy, you know, you cobble words together and, and todo se entiende, right? So thank you everybody. This concludes our panel.